Um, we're going to talk about earthly boundary layers today, uh, specifically earthly boundary layers that live in the water. Um, there's the title. This is work with uh, Jim McWilliams. Um, and we're going to talk about the ocean boundary layer. Um, I work at NCAR. We're sponsored by National Science Foundation. And I have good friends at the Office of Naval Research. And they let me wander around a bit. Um, we've been on this path for a little while. And uh, we're very much interested in this. How does the energy cascade in the water? How do we get from the mesoscale all the way to the boundary layer where things dissipate? Big eddies right here. Here's Kamagroff over here. The classic view is that there's upscale energy here. Big gap energizes the boundary layer a little bit. And finally, there's dissipation. Well, numerical simulations and also a few observations now show that this isn't a void right here anymore. OK, it's populated by a whole wealth of interesting dynamical things. Jim coined the term sub-mesoscale turbulence. It scatters energy this way, scatters energy that way. One of the interesting problems, how does this stuff talk to this stuff and that stuff? Well, we're going to focus on this little bit of the problem that's particularly interesting. Um, the scales here are one kilometer, let's say, to 10 kilometers. Um, Jim wrote this beautiful paper about a year ago. If you like the topic, as Arakal described, it's poetry. Uh, this neat thing is a one kilometer simulation of the ocean. OK, done by one of John, uh, Jim's students, Jonathan Gula, postdoc. It just shows you how rich the whole field is. OK, here's the Gulf Stream. It's populated by all these wonderful dynamical motions. If we zoom in a little bit, you'd see something like this. OK, it's vertical vorticity. You see fronts, instabilities, jets, vortices, all kinds of interesting things live here. We're interested in a particular phenomena. Uh, it ends up that submesoscale motions are hard to observe. They're at a funny scale. It's one kilometer and a bigger. Measuring platforms are difficult to see that. But here's an example. This is a synthetic aperture image of the Santa Barbara Channel. Real data. Uh, these are the Channel Islands. Um, and then you see all these black lines sprinkled throughout the whole thing. I need to tell you a little bit how uh, that instrument works. What it really sees uh, is the surface waves. Okay, So if there are no surface waves, then you get black lines. Well, what happens is scum, foam, debris on the top of the water will damp all the surface waves. So these are actually lines of heavy particles, foam, at the top of the water. So what makes the lines? That's the question. These are long filaments. If you remember the previous picture, you would make a filament, convergence of a foam line, by having rotational motions that drive the particles together in a line. Okay, They're too long. Most of them are too long to be Langmuir circulations that you would see on any lake driving around. Okay, But some of them probably are. But you can see how rich they are. They're everywhere in the flow. That scale is 110 kilometers. So you can see how thin they are at the same time. So. We're going to pose a simple boundary layer problem. We're going to ask, does an ocean boundary layer interact with those filaments? Here's Jim's been chasing this topic for a long time. Here's the theoretician's view of how this works. It's tied up with frontogenesis. Frontogenesis is a long story topic in geophysical flows. Um, started in the atmosphere, and the oceanographers have fallen in love with it. 
It's an interesting example of coupling a submesoscale motion and 3D turbulence in the boundary layer. They seem at very disparate scales. We're just curious how they might work. So the idealization is really two fronts. Uh, warm water, cold water, cold water, warm water. Here's just the filament. What happens if you go through with this particular configuration? The geostrophic current on this side is this way. The geostrophic current on this side of the filament is this way. OK, so what happens if you tickle the water here just a little bit? It will tend to sink. It will hit the bottom of the boundary layer. You will end up with a circulation this way. That will cause more downwelling, and the whole system will run away. This is an example of boundary layer induced frontogenesis. So a key part here is these secondary circulations. And they're generated by boundary layer mechanics. That's a little bit different than the classic view of this problem. So we're going to do LES of this configuration. Uh, this way I'm going to call across the front. This will be down the front or north. This will be across or east. And what we're going to do for a different twist on this problem is we're going to put winds this way and waves this way using a special set of equations and winds this way and waves this way and see if what happens to this whole system. Okay, so the filament is 2D. The, I'm going to use this nomenclature E and E plus W. That's across and across plus waves. That's north and north plus waves. Okay, we've got a big box. 12 kilometers across, 4,500, uh, 12 kilometers across, 4.5 kilometers this way. It's 250 meters deep. And we use a lot of grit. This is about 10 to the 10th points. Okay, we're going to do LES. The mixed layer depth is about 60, so that scale is more than 100. Um, it was interesting seeing the Lagrangian mean theories this morning. I can't do that math, but we're going to adopt equations that are cousins to that. Craig Leibovitch equations came before these guys, but it's an example of an example of fast motions on slow currents. Okay? Uh, the key thing of doing these equations for the ocean boundary layer, okay, we end up with these really interesting couplings between the waves and the currents. And they'll depend on the Stokes drift of the waves. So we end up with this particular set of equations. I skipped all the other terms that you already know. So it has buoyancy, rotation, the usual sets of things in a boundary layer. But it's got these new fun terms. Here's a Stokes Coriolis term. US is the Stokes velocity. This is the magic. It's U Stokes cross omega. That's a vortex force. OK, they've done the analogy. This is like a Lorentz force here. Uh, we also have Stokes drift in a scalar equation. And we do an LES. And part of our closure is a subgrid scale equation. And it has Stokes in it too. Uh, later on, we'll need. Those vorticity components, that's the Stokes drift of the wave field. Water's flat, but the Stokes drift is what shows up in the mathematics. Um, we need these angle brackets. It's a down front average, I'll remind you. OK. What happens if we don't do anything? If we just tickle the water with a little bit of wind or waves? Here it is. We start with fully developed turbulence. This is just convection. All these places are where downdrafts, downwelling starts. OK? If we run that for a little bit, we end up with this about six hours later. OK? Big difference. We're going to study this. Here's where the front ends up. That's one quarter of the box. Imagine this folded over, and then that folded over again. OK. When we started this problem, I was really curious, with all that freedom in the dynamics, will it actually do frontogenesis? So here's a cartoon. These lines are potential temperature. Here's a bunch of cold water. We're just going to let it go. Will it do what the theoretician's idea is? 
Will it make secondary circulations? Poof! There they are. If you watch the lines, they get squeezed. Ah. So we started with this big filament, squished all down. We end up with this intense gradients right here. That's the secondary circulation on this side. Secondary circulation on this side. It's just like Jim's cartoon. But we're going to add other things that disturb the cartoon. This is 12 kilometers across. OK. So let's make some statistics. This is vertical vorticity. It's the gradient, the horizontal gradient of the down, of the down front current. Okay, During frontogenesis, they get squeezed together. It's going to get sharper, 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 sharper. So it's a measure of how much frontogenetic activity happened. Okay, So we can see when we start, here's just cooling. Here's a north wind. Here's an east wind. They all do it, different rates. But they all, I had no guarantee this was going to happen. They all do that particular recipe. Down here, I've plotted the turbulent kinetic energy at the top of the water, but I've normalized it by either U star or W star. I study boundary layers a lot. You take the TKE, you normalize it by the wind stress, you get a value of 50, you go, oh my. <laughs> it really energized the water. So there's long decay. This is finite time frontogenesis, and the turbulence causes it to decay later on. Um, let's see here. Oh, if we just make averages, here's theta. Here's the down front currents. This is coming at, uh, at you. This one's going into the page. There's the secondary circulations. There's the vertical velocity that's down. Makes interesting structures. If we look at the time of maximum frontogenesis for each three of those cases, here's V prime. It ends up, that's the interesting turbulent velocity. This is to scale. okay? So it tends to make these long structures in Y. That actually is what halts the frontogenesis. So these are different. They're similar. The whole process happens. You might say, well, that's 2D turbulence. It's not 2D turbulence. It's 3D turbulence, very anisotropic. V, U, much more energy than W at the top of the water. I just made a spectrum around this. Okay, So there's various ways it could have energized the boundary layer. You could dream up different scenarios, but actually it just did the easiest thing. Just filled out the spectrum long, long down here. If we go deeper in the water, they get closer together. Presumably pressure strain correlations do their thing to equilibrate that. OK, so let's add a twist to the problem. Let's add the waves. Here's an example of Langmuir turbulence in the water. This is the Great Salt Lake. Those are foam lines that uh, are created. You, like I said, if you go just out on your typical lake when you're driving around, you see these all the time. OK, so we're going to take this. Here's a density filament. Green water here, blue water here. OK, obviously up front, there's a foam line. We're going to take these two things, stick them together run the simulations again. Here's what we saw before. Simple question. Will those waves, completely disparate scale, change this picture? So first example, here's a cross. Uh, the front plus waves, it's these blue dots. Delayed the frontogenesis just a little bit, but has the same general character. Down here, pretty noisy. Maybe perhaps more TK in the water. Okay. But that's the interesting one. This is the down front winds plus down front waves. No waves plus waves. Huge change. Huge change in what happened to the TKE. What happened? Well, that's the fun story. OK. Um, it didn't happen all at once. These are the currents at different times across the top of the water. 0, 4, 7, 10 hours. This is, these lines are with uh, no waves. You can see how sharp the currents get. That's where the frontogenesis happens. 
We add the waves. Ah, it's changed it gradually at the start, but almost over the whole flow. So they did something very dramatic. So the whole story is, can we find what it is? Let's do just a tiny bit of flow viz. OK. So in this particular picture, minus 6 to 6, I can't show you the whole full field at once. It just, there's not enough pixels on the screen to do that. So I'm plotting just a little piece right here in the domain, just looking at the downwelling. Winds and waves are this way. Ah, oh, you see the signatures of the Langmuir circulation. But there's a clear hint that they're bending over. OK? Uh, this is the vertical vorticity as we're going along. You can see there's the secondary circulation picks up. On this side of the front, the down, well, the, uh, down front current is out of the port. So they're opposed to the generation of the Langmuir cells. Let's skip over to the other side. Now we're way over here to the right. OK? Now we're really in the far field, and it really looks like the far field picture that we're used to seeing for homogeneous boundary layers. OK? What happens in the middle? Ah, that's neat. So we're looking right there where all the front stuff happened. First of all, here's the vertical vorticity normalized by F. It's got two peaks. Two peaks, not one peak. One there, and another one there along this line. Here's the Langmuir cells on this side. Here's the ones that gradually disappeared from the west. At first, your interpretation is that's the same signature of the Langmuir cells. It's not. It would take a little bit more of talk to show you, but that's actually just vortices generated by a really intense current. Okay, so. The waves have really disturbed the whole frontogenic process. This is now 500 meters wide, before everything happened in less than 100 meters. OK. Four panels. Here's theta. Here's the currents in and out of the page. Here's the currents this way. And here's the downwelling. Each one of them has a wave effect. This horizontal current is affecting cold water over warm water. Get unstable stratification. Didn't happen in any of the other calculations. Now the V current, before I showed you a picture where they were perfectly matched into the page, out of the page. Now they're overlaying each other. Okay. So there's a really intense vertical shear layer here that scales with the Depth of the Stokes drift. Very different. Down here, here's the most surprising thing. We end up with two downwellings, not one. OK. We need a little bit of math. Can we figure out what the waves did? Jim likes this. Turbulent thermal wind. Very heavy duty article in JFM. We're just going to borrow a few things from it. See what happened. This is a really neat idea. We're trying to diagnose what physical processes made those dramatic changes. TTW, it's a diagnostic model, the way I'm going to use it. It's linear, steady, combines hydrostatic balance, Ekman boundary layer dynamics, and wave effects. We can get all those kinds of things from the LES. Hydrostatic balance. This is actually the secret to the whole thing. If we just had DPDZ equal buoyancy, you would be completely happy. But when you go through the CL equations, we get some extra terms on the right-hand side depending on the direction of the waves. These are the vortex forces. For a homogeneous boundary layer, these guys are only a function of z. But we have a heterogeneous boundary layer. They're functions of x also. Very different. So if you take that simple idea, okay, you combine it with this, 
you get this. Here's the diagnostic momentum balance for V. If we just had this, that's geostrophic balance. You'd be perfectly happy. But we're in the boundary layer, so there's a vertical divergence of turbulence. That's the resolved piece of the LES. Here's the subgrid part. Those equations, here's one of the wave effects. That's Stokes drift. What happens in all these problems, the fact that the waves are, Stokes drift is propagating that way, the Lagrangian, causes an up wave current. But this piece, uh-oh, we got these extra terms. If you stare at this equation, this one with down front waves depends on the vertical vorticity. Remember zeta this is really big when we do frontogenesis. It's got a negative sign. It's going to put a break on it. This one generates the secondary circulation, which is done by turbulence. Let's do something really simple. Let's calculate this, that, that, that from the LES. So there we are. X is at the bottom. We've calculated those five terms over this little piece of the domain where we saw all that interesting stuff. So let's just walk through the terms here just a little bit and see what happened. This pink term, that's the Stokes Coriolis. It just depends on how big the wave field is. So it's a constant across the box. Okay, good. The bare clinic term, okay, on the west side of the front, it's going to make the jet come out of the page. On the right side, it's going to drive the jet into the page. Well, remember I said this piece made it unstable because of the Ekman transport across the front. So it goes up here, much bigger than the far field parts. Uh, it's also interesting, the turbulent flux is the same size. But the new term <laughs> right here, this vortex force term, is bigger than all of these, and it's the opposite sign. I put a break on the flow. If we sum this black curve, this pink curve, this blue one, this green one, we get this red. That's an estimate from Jim's turbulent thermal wind of what the V current is for this flow. Well, of course we, can, we have the real answer from LES. Get this dotted line. So sure enough, the simple idea told us what happened. Didn't expect this, okay? So it says, at least observationally, you would see a very dramatic difference. If you went outside in the field, you put instruments on this side of the front, this side of the front, you should see a very big difference in the front of genetic activity, depending on the direction of the winds and waves. So, we, we did high resolution LES, 10 to the 10th grid points. We found that boundary layers can induce front genesis. Very uncertain that that was actually going to happen. It's a finite time arrest, scales less than 100 meters. When we stare at these answers quite a bit, this production term, it's a horizontal flux times the gradient. Normally you always think of of arrest done by something in the vertical. But here, it's actually done by something in the horizontal. Okay, it's U prime V prime horizontal times that gradient that generates all the TKE. It's, a, it's as if you took a parallel shear flow, flopped it on its side, and let the winds or currents squeeze and squeeze together, that's the key term. What we showed 
based on the CL equations, okay, the very different between whether it's cross front waves or down front waves. With cross front ones, we actually enhance the TKE. Down front waves, they really alter the notion of how secondary circulations and the idealization of how filament frontogenesis works in the water. Make the frontal zone broad, they weaken these gradients. We found two frontal sites. They greatly changed the coherent structures in the flow. Okay, I talked a little bit about this. So, unfortunately, it makes life harder, <laughs> but it serves to glue fast motions together with boundary layer turbulence, together with very large scale sub mesoscale turbulence. Um, and I'll stop there. Thanks. Any questions for our speaker? I have a question. Go ahead. Could you speculate if about what if you change something? So you had a north wind. You added a north wind coming in. What if you had a northeast wind? Or what if you had something coming from a different angle? How do you think that would change? Would you the like to run the code? We can do that. <laughs> we could run the code. Uh, no doubt when you have this, a combination like that, it's going to have feature, features of both sort of things. Uh, so what it really, it just opens up the parameter space. It's no longer just cooling and winds. It's cooling winds plus wave directions. Um, most of the times out in the real ocean, the winds and waves are not in equilibrium with each other. Okay, You have swell generated by a big storm, big hurricane Fran or Florence. They propagate somewhere else. So wherever you're measuring, they're very much in disequilibrium with the local situation. So complexity. Thank you. Questions? So, uh, Pete, do you think this is the perfect situation for waves to affect the turbulent structure of the boundary layer and its dissipation? Uh, I'm sorry, I missed it a little bit. Do you think this is the perfect situation, kind of the perfect storm situation, for the waves to be impacting yes. uh, the turbulence? Yes. Yep. Um, so, the way this this just teases you to do more realistic things. Okay, so the spectrum we used here for Stokes Drift was very idealized. What you would really do is run a wave model, calculate the wave field. From the wave field, you can calculate the Stokes Drift uh, to actually make it be very much more faithful to the actual mechanics at that particular place you're measured. If the winds and waves are very misaligned, then different mechanics happen in that problem. Any other questions? OK, let's thank our speaker again. So our next speaker. He is um, Stephen Tobias from the University of Leeds. He's going to talk about the interaction of turbulence and mean flows and fields in rotating systems. And uh, once again, I want to uh, remind everybody that the last talk will not be given by me today. It will be given by Masumi. And uh, I wanted to thank her once again for agreeing to switch with me. So. I think this works. Does this work? Yeah. Microphone? You've got to stay awake, Nick. I'm going to be addressing all questions soon. So I'd like to thank Arakel again for the invitation to a wonderful, wonderful workshop. I know it's been a long day, but uh, let's see if we can get through to the end. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about statistical, that's the wrong one, isn't it? Statistical simulation and the quasi-linear approximation in GAFD. And this is work I've been doing mainly with my longtime collaborator, Brad Marston, who's uh, at Brown. 
And these are people who've been working with us on the, uh, what we call the generalized quasi-linear approximation. So um, I'm going to do a very brief introduction to what we call direct statistical simulation, which is related to uh, what Amitava talked about yesterday and um, Rick Salmon earlier on. And it, it, all it is is it's uh, a way of, of essentially simulating the statistics of a geophysical flow using certain approximations. What we're going to try and do is have a look at how well those approximations do, and we're going to evaluate them actually just within the DNS framework by taking out some kind of triadic interactions uh, in, the, in the manner of, of Craikman. Um, I'm then going to try and apply these approximations to probably only one model problem, but I've got three lined up. One of which is the joint instability of magnetic field and differential rotation that Malsumi is about to talk about. So if nothing else, you'll get a nice introduction to Malsumi's talk. Uh, I'm going to talk about two other, uh, method, two other situations. One is convectively driven flows, and then perhaps talk a little bit about stochastically forced stable layers. Okay. So why might you be interested in simulating the statistics? Well, in astrophysics, uh, it's, it's very difficult to simulate direct numerical simulation of all scales. And so uh, this quote from Lorenz, an alternative, an alternative procedure which does not suffer this disadvantage, and the disadvantage Lorenz was talking about is that uh, the data you get from uh, DNS looks essentially the same as the data you get from observations. Now, I think that would be an unfair criticism of astrophysical uh, uh, DNS because we ha have essentially zero observations of us in astrophysics, but still. But he says, an alternative procedure which does not suffer this disadvantage consists of deriving a new system of equations whose unknown are the statistics themselves. This is a very old idea. Essentially goes back to Boussinesque and Reynolds. Um, and usually these statistical models are derived to yield information about the statistical properties of a system. Or perhaps, as we heard earlier, they, they may give you the statistical properties of certain unresolved scales, sort of subgrid scale models. And they usually rely on some kind of truncation or approximation. So uh, Andrew earlier talked about whether you could go into a Lagrangian frame, in which case you could get some linear equations, but you just push the difficulty somewhere else. And if you don't, if you work in an Eulerian frame, then you tend to get a hierarchy of equations, and you have to do something to that hierarchy in order to make progress. Uh, so there's always some, you know, you never get something for nothing. There's always some truncation or approximation you have to make. And what this talk about is just trying to evaluate some of these approximations. As I say, this is, a, this is an old idea. And lots of people have been working on this uh, what we call direct statistical simulation over the past few years. It has different names in different communities. Uh, Farrell and Yuanu call it uh, stochastic structural stability theory, for, for those of you who know about that. So why, why might you simulate the statistics? Well, the low order statistics, they're going to be smoother in space than the instantaneous flow. So you might be able to simulate them with fewer degrees of spatial freedom. And they might evolve slowly in time, or perhaps not at all. So they're going to be described by the, either a fixed point, or, if you, or the evolution might be on a slow manifold. And so you might be able to use um, uh, time-stepping methods that are designed uh, for evolution on the slow manifold. These statistics usually describe that kind of average behavior and low-order variations about the mean, perhaps the two-point correlation functions. Uh, and the hope is, if I could spell, that statistics are less sensitive to changes in the parameters than the detailed dynamics. It's important to point out, though, that in usually in geophysics and astrophysics, if you're doing a global problem, that the correlations or the statistics are usually non-local, and they're usually highly anisotropic in, and inhomogeneous. And this, this makes it computationally uh, less efficient uh, to solve for them, but given the fact that computers are, are getting faster and faster, it's worth a go. So that's what we're trying to do. And one would hope that you, your statistical formulation should also respect conservation laws. So Amitava was talking about dynamo theory. And in, in dynamo theory, uh, a lot of people think it's very important that magnetic helicity is conserved. And so if you do a statistical 
uh, formalism of dynamo theory, you would like whatever you're doing to conserve magnetic helicity. Perhaps you might have the same feelings about potential vorticity or whatever in whatever problem you're doing. Okay. So what are the options if you want to know something about the statistics? Well, it's well known that in some sense the answers, you can write down a very simple equation which will just give you the answer. For, I mean, for any dynamical system, you could just try and simulate the PDFs and use perron frobenius theory, uh, derive some kind of Fokker-Planck or Liouville equations, and, and this really does just give you the answer. You can write down the equation that you have to solve. The problem is you just can't solve it. I mean, it's computationally impossible to do. Um, you could use uh, moment hierarchies, uh, and of course these usually assume you can make progress uh, on, on, with paper and pen, usually assuming isotropy or homogeneity of the statistics, and that's a nice thing to do. Uh, if you're interested in rare events, that this is also a statistical theory, you could use large deviation theory to work out when large events or flipping are going to occur, or the distributions of these rare events. Well, what I'm going to be talking about today is something uh, that Sam alluded to, is to use cumulant discard methods. And these take into account the inhomogeneity and anisotropy of the flow. And they also, they're very useful in cases where you have the interaction of mean flows with turbulence or mean magnetic fields with turbulence. Okay. So I'm not going to go into details. This is a rather a busy slide about how cumulant discard methods work, but I'll, I'll try my best to, to summarize in, in a couple of minutes. So you take your PDE or your set of PDEs, so your, maybe your momentum induction equation or energy equation, which usually has a linear part and a nonlinear part, and maybe some stochastic driving. And you define your cumulants, and you do a, a, a Reynolds average. So you split into means and fluctuations. So you take your, your variable, and you define it to, be, to have a mean part and a fluctuating part. And then you define your cumulant by saying the first cumulant is essentially the mean. And I haven't said whether I'm, uh, what kind of mean I'm taking at the moment. It could be an ensemble mean. It could be a zonal average. It could be really any kind of mean. Um, so the first cumulant is the mean. And the second cumulant is the uh, fluctuation, fluctuation interaction at two different points in space, which is often called the two-point correlation function. And the third cumulant is defined like this. And then you can derive evolution equations for the cumulants. There's two ways of, of doing this. You could use the uh, hop functional technique uh, from uh, uh, nonlinear statistical mechanics, uh, which is also in Uriel Frisch's book. Or you could just use brute force uh, to derive these evolution equations for the cumulants, which I've written in a in a uh, symbolic way, the, the, the actual equations are a lot more complicated than this. And you can see that the, um, this is what Andrew was alluding to, that the evolution equation to the fir for the first cumulant, you, need, you require knowledge of the second cumulant. So you write down an evolution equation for the second cumulant, and you require uh, knowledge of the third cumulant, et cetera, et cetera. And so you have this infinite hierarchy of cumulant equations, and so you have to do something about that. So you truncate the cumulant hierarchy. Uh, you'd like to do this maintaining conservation laws and realizability. Uh, so if you truncate at second order by setting the projection of the third cumulant onto the evolution equation for the second cumulant to zero, uh, then you only need to solve these two equations. Then this is a quasi-linear self-consistent mean field theory. And sometimes this is called CE2. This is a cumulant expansion truncated at second order. And you can derive the same equations in a completely different way, uh, which is what Farrell and Ioannou did for their stochastic structural stability theory. So a cumulant expansion truncated at second order is formally analogous to, to this theory. Truncation at third order, by setting the projection of the fourth cumulant onto the third cumulant equation to zero is equivalent to an anisotropic inhomogeneous EDQNM, uh, which we heard about earlier on. Now, these things you, you couldn't possibly hope to solve analytically, um, like, like uh, we heard earlier. So you're just going to use computational methods to try and solve these. 
But, be but before I, I, I show you how well any of these things work, let's go back to these degrees of approximation. I said that C2 was a quasi-linear approximation. And what does this mean in terms of triad interactions? Well, if you define uh, your mean and you have your fluctuation, and here we're thinking about a zonal mean, just for, just for definiteness, then a quasi-linear approximation includes the interaction of a mean with a fluctuation to give you a fluctuation, and the fluctuation, fluctuation giving you a mean, but it doesn't include the fluctuation, fluctuation to give you another fluctuation. So this is sometimes called the eddy, eddy nonlinearity, or in mean field electrodynamics, it's called the pain in the neck term, hence the, the pin term, okay. And often um, it's, um, justified by, by saying that the eddies are sheared apart by the mean flows. And you know in certain asymptotic limits, it's exact. So if you have a separation of time scales, <clears throat> or in, in um, near, near statistical equilibrium, then you can, you can prove that this is an exact representation of the dynamics. And what's nice about this is that this approximation can, uh, conserves global linear and quadratic invariants. Um, because it's an example of what Creighton called constrained triad decimation in pairs. We're taking out these uh, triad interactions in pairs. And so therefore, global quadratic invariants would tend to be <coughs> um, uh, conserved. Of course, because we're taking out the eddy-eddy going to eddy interactions, there is no local cascade or inverse cascade within this approximation. It's all what, uh, what might be called an, a, a non-local uh, uh, inverse cascade or cascade. Um, and um, the phases are arbitrary. Okay. So as I said, the inhomogeneous statistical formulation of this approach is, is, is called C2, or stochastic structural stability theory. So there's, there's been a lot of evaluation of when this approximation might work. And the plasma physicists uh, are very interested in this. The effectiveness of this approximation in, in fluids and plasmas is often most measured by the Cubo number, uh, which is given by uh, R for Cubo, uh, which is the uh, essentially a ratio of a RMS velocity over, a, uh, over a, essentially a velocity which you form from the correlation length and the correlation time of the turbulence. So if R is small, if the Cubo number is small, then you might expect the quasi-linear approximation to do well. Unfortunately, you don't know whether it's going to do well until you've done the calculation. And so this is like uh, one of those uh, useless numbers that you only know after you've done the, the calculation. OK. So just to say, there, there are some people who shall remain nameless who believe that C2, or stochastic structural stability theory, always seems to work, because they always look at problems where it works and then declare victory. I think it's fair to say that it doesn't always work, of course, and the statistical formulation of this approximation can be shown to break down as you move away from statistical equilibrium. So you want to do something, something a bit better. OK, I won't say too much about that. This is just my, my view as to when it works and, and when it doesn't work. We know for a fact it doesn't work for homogeneous isotropic turbulence because there is no mean, there is no mean field to, to essentially linearize about. So we, we'd like to um, generalize this uh, quasi-linear approximation. So what we do is, we, instead of separating into means and fluctuations, we separate into long and short-scale interactions. Okay? And so we call this a generalized uh, quasi-linear interaction. And we, so what we, we call the large scales, all those, if we're thinking about things in spatial wave numbers, spectral wave numbers, all those um, uh, tr uh, waves or, or spectral modes with wave number less than some cutoff lambda, uh, they're going to be our large scales. All the ones with it bigger than lambda are going to be our fluctuations. And we're keeping certain triad interactions so we're going to keep the large scales interacting with the large scales to give us large scales. We're going to keep the large scales interacting with the small scales to give us small scales. And we're going to keep the small scale, small scale going, going to large scale interactions. Okay. And we're going to get rid of all of these triad interactions. Essentially, we have to get rid of, of these. Well, we certainly want to, we want to get rid of the small scale, small scale going to small scales, because otherwise we're not going to be able to close the system. We also have to get rid of these 
um, in order for, for our uh, approximation to be energy conserving or quadratic conserving um, because we want it to be an example of what Creighton called the uh, triad decimation in pairs. <clears throat> What's interesting about this is unlike the quasi-linear approximation, energy can be scattered into long, well, between short scale modes via interactions with the means. So for example, if you have uh, say an m equals 10 mode and it interacts with a large scale mode which could now be an m equals 1 mode that can give me an m equals 11 mode okay whereas for the actual quasi linear approximation you can only get energy uh, through the mean back into the same wave number and it turns out that leads to dissipation that is not there in the quasi linear approximation okay I don't want to say too much about this. It, it turns out that because this uh, is linear in the in the in the low, we've got low and high modes. We call them low and high modes. Uh, because this uh, approximation leads to a linear equation in the high modes, you can actually close the system and get a statistical theory or statistical closure for the evolution of the low modes. But I won't say too much about that. Why is that not doing it? I'm going to go on to talk about uh, some evaluation of these methods. And you can think really of three types of turbulent uh, interactions with the means. Okay, And I'm going to show you some, some movies. So you can think of these two, we're going to be putting energy in at small scales. And because of correlations, in this case induced by rotation, the large scales are going to emerge. So we're going to get mean flows emerging from small scale, small scale interactions. And in this case, let me get some movies. We're going to have a large scale which is going to go un unstable, and then that's going to uh, lead to turbulence, which is going to uh, re uh, readjust the large scales to marginality. So this is this is a well-known problem. This is stochastically forced uh, turbulence on a sphere. One gets uh, uh, nonlinear Rossby vortices. And in the end, these vortices will lead to the formation of jets. You can get the same kind of dynamics on a beta plane. Uh, so this is where we inject energy on small scales, and it leads to the generation of large-scale shear flows. This one I'll talk a little bit about if I have some time. Uh, this is, again, uh, it's a similar kind of model, but the energy is being injected via convection. So we have convective rolls. Uh, and because of correlations with the rotation, they lead to the formation of shears. And so this is all blue across the top and all red across the bottom. This is an example of uh, the Busser thermal annulus. Uh, and the final thing I'm going to try and evaluate, actually this is going to be the first one, is going to be one where I, I have a, differ a large scale differential rotation. We're now looking at is it from the pole. It undergoes an m equals 1 instability. Uh, this is a global instability. Here we have it going turbulent. This nice projection. The turbulence acts so as to redistribute the angular momentum and therefore change the differential rotation and, in fact, the magnetic field. And this is, this is the model or a vari variation of this model that I think Maosumi is going to be talking about in the next talk. OK, so let, let me just introduce this model. So, there are situations where if you have a latitudinal differential rotation, it's stable hydrodynamically, but if you add a magnetic field, it actually undergoes a joint instability. So all the energy is derived from the, from the shear flow, and the magnetic field acts as a conduit to allow instability. Okay. So stable profiles of latitudinal differential rotation may be destabilized by the presence of a magnetic field, uh, and the turbulence acts so as to redistribute angular momentum and magnetic flux. And this is Malsumi's talk, so I won't say too much about it. So let me just show the movie again. It's the same movie. So we get this turbulence while the movie's going on. What we, what we do here is we average, um, we average over longitude. This is a 2D model. Uh, we average over longitude and we, we plot the, the, uh, the radial vorticity as a function of time the average radial vorticity. And for the values of parameters we, we've put in, this reaches a steady state where the uh, angular, or on average, the uh, angular velocity has been uh, redistributed uh, to a marginal state.
Okay, so this is quite simple dynamics that you would hope a statistical theory would be able to reproduce. It turns out that if you change the dissipation, you, de you decrease the dissipation by increasing the magnetic Reynolds number, which is a measure of the magnetic dissipation, you can get uh, bifurcations from this state. So let, let just focus on the, on the purple, uh, the purple uh, circles, because they're the fully nonlinear uh, uh, solutions. What we have is a bifurcation uh, where we go from, uh, uh, well, we go from being stable to being uh, destabilized, uh, steady solutions of the type we just saw. And then you undergo some complicated dynamics uh, where you can get hysteresis between two different states. So this is interesting if you have a statistical theory. How would a statistical theory describe a situation where you have hysteresis between two states? Which state would it choose? Or would it choose somewhere, somewhere in the middle? And interestingly enough, if you go to a high enough magnetic Reynolds number, you get a relaxation oscillation between those two states, a near hysteretic transition. So this was the, um, the, differential the, the differential rotation pattern down here. And for high RM, you get this bursting behavior between the, a, a low vorticity state and a high vorticity state. And this is a near heteroclinic state. So it was an interesting question to us. It's like, how do the various approximations, like the quasi-linear approximation or the generalized quasi-linear approximation do and, in fact, the statistical theory C2 do at capturing any of this dynamics? Well, the answer is still on this, uh, on this page. So C2, you remember, was the statistical theory. And you can see it does very well at getting the initial bifurcation when we're going to uh, steady, um, steady modes. Interestingly enough, for some solutions where the, uh, where the real dynamics goes to a steady state, the statistical simulation goes to an oscillatory state. Uh, and then further on, let's go here, where we have this near heteroclinic solution, the statistical theory picks somewhere in the middle, okay, which is kind of interesting. I'll come back to that in a minute. If we do, um, remember the C2 is equivalent to a quasi-linear approximation. If we do uh, generalized quasi-linear approximations with different cutoffs in the large scales, then you see, uh, Let's go to the blue one. The blue one does much better here. It tracks the uh, purple one to here, so it gets steady when it should be getting steady. Here it does OK as well. It does, for some reason, when the, um, the real solution shows hysteresis, the uh, uh, GQL has already gone into a, a relaxation oscillation, but it does manage to, to uh, reproduce the uh, relaxation oscillation which I, I think is quite interesting. So just to, just to recap on that, so for the steady type solutions, the quasi-linear theory in C2 do quite well. They're, they're very good at reproducing. So, so one of these is a, this is, um, this is the DNS and this is the quasi-linear theory. And, but when we have this kind of relaxation oscillation, you need to go to a generalized quasi-linear approximation to be able to reproduce this bursting behavior. OK. OK, so I have five minutes left. So I just want to show you uh, a couple of other uh, evaluations of this approximation. The second model we, we took is, is this um, so-called Busser annulus which you get by essentially uh, doing a quasi-geostrophic model of convection uh, in, in a planet. And so you, uh, as Busser did, you uh, average over the, over the z-coordinate. And what happens is you get small-scale convection cells plus the Taylor-Proudman theorem lead to the generation of, of zonal flows, as I showed you earlier. Um, so these equations that are written down for the, um, for the evolution of, this is, this is V is a stream function. Don't ask me why, then we call it V here. Yeah. Um, this, this evolution equation looks very similar to some evolution equations we've seen earlier. And what happens is you can get bursting behavior again um, via thermal forcing, driving a shear flow. That shear flow switches off the convection 
uh, which is itself uh, generating the shear flow, and you get this relaxation oscillation. So in a similar way, we were trying to understand uh, whether um, uh, quasi-linear behavior or quasi-linear approximation and GQL can, um, can reproduce this. I'm not going to show you the movies. We're going to look at three types of behavior here, one of which is where we get what we call quasi-steady large-scale jets. So if you want to know the parameter values at which you can find these, these are two, uh, two papers in which these solutions have been identified. So these are quasi-linear large-scale jets. So you're going across this way at the top and this way at the bottom. You can also, if you change the rotation rate, get multiple jets. So in this one, we have seven jets. Um, so you can get quasi-steady multiple jets. Or, and this one's the most interesting. I will show the movie for this. Uh, this, this one is, gives you this bursting behavior where you get some jets. Actually, this, this is this period where it's trying to make its mind up what to do. And you get this, these jets after a while possibly sometime today, thank you, here we go. And then they start to switch off the convection and burst between uh, dynamics where you get strong jets and, uh, or strong convection. And you get this kind of predator-prey dynamics between the jets and the convection. Oh, okay, so this is uh, UY, so this is the, the velocity in the vertical. This is UX, the zonal velocity. This is the vorticity, and this is the temperature perturbation. OK, so I'm rapidly running out of time. So just to say, in terms of getting the, um, the deep jets, the large scale jets, uh, well, if you, if you keep all your modes, so you're doing DNS, this is what you get. And even doing GQL with one mode manages to reproduce this. Although, interestingly, the quasi-linear approximation doesn't. Um, if you have multiple jets, uh, quasi-linear approximation gives you the wrong number of jets, uh, but actually even going to one mode in GQL gives you the correct number of jets. To get the bursting behavior, you have to work a, a little bit harder. I think, uh, I think it's worth saying you probably need to go to five, five uh, modes in GQL. Actually, 10 or 15 modes is, is even better. So I'm, I'm rapidly running out of time. So I won't say anything about how one can make a direct statistical simulation faster. I'll, I'll conclude by saying uh, direct statistical simulation, it can be an efficient way of solving for the low order statistics. But beware, the cheapest version of direct statistical simulation does not work. And it doesn't really, well, it works close to, close to equilibrium, statistical equilibrium. But as you move away from statistical equilibrium, it can be, uh, begin to break down. Now, you can just go to higher order and do um, C3, which is the anisotropic uh, EDQNM, or you can try doing a statistical theory based on GQL. And we think this might be a better way to go because GQL, it does allow for scattering of energy from eddies from one scale to another. And this manages to get eddy down to the dis ed um, energy down to the dissipative scales. It conserves quadratic invariance. Uh, we don't think you have any problems with realizability. And it's certainly better at reproducing the low order statistics of flows for these two problems. Um, other approaches use ensemble averaging to give what we call ensemble CE2, but I haven't said anything about that, and I'm not certain I ever will. So thank you for your attention. <laughs> Questions? In, in one of your last slides, it seems like uh, you get in the quasi-linear simulations even more jets than in the yeah. DNS ones. Yeah, that's right. Uh, is, is, yeah. Does that mean that eddy-eddy interactions are not important here to get, to get the jets? And why do you get even more? I, th I think, well, eddy-eddy, OK, so that, that's a good point. Eddy-eddy interactions are not important to get the jets. And that's been known since um, Srinivasan and, and Young. Uh, they, they did essentially a, a, a quasi-linear closure. And right, that, that was in a QG system, though. So here it's different. Oh, OK. So yeah, that, that's true. Uh, so it, it's still not needed. Uh, it's interesting why, uh, why we get the wrong number of jets. Of course, the jet, jet's number change due to jet merging. 
And of course, stochastic fluctuations, which come from the eddy eddy nonlinearity, may kick you out of a basin of attraction of, say, this, this quasi linear thing and, and give you jet merging, which, which I think could be a way of, of understanding it. It, it, might, it might be that the eddy mean interactions, which are what's left here after you take out the eddy eddy, are the ones that are taking you to the zero wave number and giving you the jet. Would that they be they certainly take you to the zero wave number, but the, the question is how, how would one might get from a state here with, say, nine jets to the correct answer, which is with seven jets. Yeah, yeah. And the answer is usually by you know, the jets coming together because they're being stochastically buffeted. And, and, and so if, if you leave out that that nonlinearity, then you might not be able to get to the correct number of jets. But interestingly enough, you seem to be able to get there just by including one mode in the generalized quasi-linear approximation. Yeah, yeah, very nice. Yeah, thanks. Steve, you have an interesting problem of where, oh, if you have a DNS system available to refer to, it may allow you to select which of your approximations yeah. might be effective. Yeah. Where does all of this go? So yeah, I quite often get asked this. So, so there's a philosophical question, which is how many times I, I will have to show DSS working by comparing it with a, with a DNS before anybody will get, let me get away without doing the DNS. And the answer is, I don't think, I, I don't think that's bounded. I don't think you can, I, I will never be able to say, here's DSS, you, you believe it. Because somebody will just say, well, what did the DNS do? Well, you, well, you have many flavors of DNS. I do. I have. Yes, that, that's true. So uh, my, my hope is that we're trying to break it as often as we can, and whatever's left standing is the winner, and then we'll go off and try it with, with say, dynamos or something like that. Yeah. Thank you. I wanted to ask a question about the bursting phenomenon in the convective case. Um, it would sort of seem at kind of just an intuitive physical level, like uh, it, the phenomenon could be kind of captured by the wave mean flow interaction, and that you know you have the convective plumes rising, and they just get sheared apart basically. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, and yet you described that that's not well captured by the um, CE2 variant. So I was wondering if you could just say a few words about um, just in a physical sense, like what is the nonlinearity that causes CE2 to not behave well in that case? Yeah, it's, we're still looking into that. I think what happens with C2 is it tends to just choose one of the states, and there's not enough, essentially, stochasticity in the model to, to, to kind of get you to... I think once you get away from the basin of attraction of one of these states, then, um, then you, would, you would see this near heteroclinic behavior. But I don't think we've... Man I, I think maybe if you added a stochastic term, which is a bit of a strange thing to do in a stochastic theory, which is meant to have averaged over them, then I think that may enable, just knock you out of that basin of attraction. But I, I think the answer is we don't know. It's to do with this, the relative stability of the basins of attraction. That's it. Thank you. Wow. I thought you'd all be asleep. So uh, related to the last question, hmm. how do you initialize these? If you initialized it with the correct number of jets, would it stay there? Yeah, that's if a good If you question. initialized... Uh, GQL with five modes with the wrong number of jets, would it stay there? Yeah, so we've, we've, we've tried a bit of this. So if you, if you initialize uh, C2, the statistical theory, in, say, a low vorticity state, it stays there. And if you uh, do it in a high vorticity state, it stays there. So, so this is, goes back to the state. If you initialize GQL with the wrong number of jets, it goes to the right number of jets. If you initialize QL with the right number of jets, at least in our experience, it stays at the right number of jets. Um, yeah, we don't really understand that. <laughs> uh, Steve, you anticipated uh, originally that the time step can be longer. In uh, can you give us an idea to what extent that actually holds but, up? Okay, so my my hope in life is that if you if you do a statistical theory. And you you step you you can step to a, a slowly evolving statistical state. So this may be a fixed point of your dynamical system. So if if you had say a Newton solver which could handle these, then you, you could you you wouldn't have to do time stepping. You could just solve for that nonlinear state. Then if you change the parameters, you could continue in that nonlinear state, statistical state. That I think is the long term hope, and we're hoping to do that using 
what we call a reduced basis method, which I didn't talk about. And we, we hope very much that the reduced basis that you take for one parameter values, if you change the parameters only by a small amount, the reduced basis will not change too much. Add, well, in this evaluation, we're doing all this evaluation in, in DNS, and so it's, it's the same time step. It's the same. But when we do, if we do the CE2, it's a much bigger time step. Yeah. So I'll, I'll ask one last question. Um, in, in this example, yeah. you, you expressed the, the lack of um, uh, large, uh, small scales transitioning as being a possible uh, solution to uh, QL0 uh, deficiencies. Yeah. But I'm wondering what the role of large-scale spatial inhomogeneity is, because that's actually what you're, you're predicting in all these generalized, more mode uh, quasi-linear yeah, problems. That's, I mean, in, in, in the case of the stochastically forced jet, which is an easier one to think about, the quasi-linear theory does a very good job at, pre at predicting what uh, Srinivasan and Young call a zonostrophic instability. It gets that wavelength dead on, but then, then, they, then they merge, these jets merge, and that's where it's not so good. So it's good for some parts, but as the evolution goes on, it, it's not so good. Yeah. Uh, all right, I think we'll end the discussion uh, here, and thanks, Steve, one more time. So our final talk today is going to be given by uh, Matsumi Dikpati of NCAR HAO, and she's going to talk about the role of tech, yes. techocline nonlinear oscillations in producing solar seasons. <coughs> Thank you, and um, <coughs> sorry about my bias. <coughs> I had a bad flu infection last week, and and didn't still recover from the cough. Um, Steve gave very nice uh, mention of uh, what I'll be talking about. Um, so uh, I'll be talking about the role of tachoclin nonlinear oscillations in producing <coughs> solar seasons. Oh, this doesn't work. Pointer doesn't work, right? Oh, yes, yes, so it works. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, basically, uh, tachoclin nonlinear non oscillations arise from the joint instability that Steve mentioned um, in the solar tachoclin. It is the instability among uh, the Rashby waves, differential rotation, and magnetic field there. Before going into the theory, I want to um, describe what uh, the seasonal variability is. Um, you know, the solar activity, variability in solar activity occur uh, in different scales, starting from a decadal scale, which is known as the solar cycle, and then you can have um, much longer term variability, which uh, gives rise to modern minima or medieval maxima type uh, features. And then if you look at 
um, individual solar cycle, then within a solar cycle there is a variability that is almost of the same order of magnitude like the solar cycle variability. And this is, uh, uh, this variability is much more important, uh, I mean equally important um, like the solar activity cycle because um, during, the, uh, the, during the peak of this variability, small scale variability which we call the burst phase uh, and, um, in the, um, uh, and there is, uh, it's followed by a quieter phase. During this bursty phase, the um, um, uh, energetic events like CME flares, they occur. 90% of the X-class flares occur during this bursty phase. And irrespective of the amplitude of the overall cycle, it can happen in the um, bursty phase. For example, um, you know that cycle 24, which is the weakest in 100 years, um, in one of the bursty phase, a Carrington type event occurred in, uh, in 2000, July 2012. So irrespective of the overall amplitude, um, in a bursty phase, things can happen which can be hazardous for, for uh, terrestrial system. These are basic, and, and these are not random, and this has, this has a periodicity which is, um, uh, six to 18 months, it's like uh, a quasi-periodic seasons. And why I call them seasons, uh, I'll come later, because actually it's not named by me. It was named by the discoverer of these people, <coughs> of this um, um, topic. This, um, when it was first observed long ago in the uh, sunspot uh, number data, it was called uh, Riga type periodicity or quasi biennial oscillation. If it's closer to six months, then it's more Riga type, and if it's closer to 18 months or two years, then it's quasi biennial. But why they are called seasons? Because this variability is reflected in the CME rate and flare rate. So um, these dashed lines are plotted in one year interval approximately, and you can see how they are correlated. That during the burst season, there, there is a burst of CMEs, enhanced burst of CMEs and flares. Now, what are the cause of these um, um, bursty and quiet seasons that create the seasons in space weather? So um, their global organizations indicate that they most likely originate in the deep interior, primarily in the CR layer, the tachocline. Tachocline is a thin layer that straddles the base of the convection zone, helioseism helioseismically discovered. And we recently demonstrated that tachocline nonlinear oscillation occurring due to the exchange of energies between the differential rotation and Rossby waves there cause these quasi-periodic seasons. So um, uh, uh, in order to um, explain the theoretical, um, uh, theoretical origin of these seasons, I will model the tachocline in um, MHD shallow water approximation. That approximation works well for the tachocline because it's a thin layer. And in shallow water approximation, uh, <clears throat> basically a fluid layer has more um, horizontal motions than the vertical motions. Since the tachocline is very thin, the motions are primarily horizontal there uh, than uh, radial. And in this model, that uh, bottom, uh, bottom uh, of the tachocline is a rigid surface, and the top is deformable. Uh, the top is a deformable surface. And uh, the system, um, the horizontal flows and fields are independent of radius, whereas the vertical flow and field are linear functions of radius, um, which is zero at the bottom boundary. 
So this is not the solar surface. This is basically the tachoclean top surface. And this is the bottom of the tachoclean. And horizontal gradient of total pressure is proportional to the horizontal gradient of cell thickness. This is a picture of the tachoclean in force balance. The um, equilibrium uh, of the tachoclean uh, is a balance among three latitudinal forces, which is hydrostatic um, pressure gradient, magnetic curvature stress, and Coriolis force. Due to that, you can have a little ob uh, obliqueness at that uh, equator and little proliteness at the polar region. Due to the um, instability of this system, the modes that can occur um, have this kind of structure. M equal to 0 mode, uh, M is the longitudinal wave number. M equal to 0, M equal to 1, M equal to 2. Basically, the large scale longitudinal wave numbers occur there. M equal to 0 is nothing but the um, uh, polar slip. Um, M equal to 1 is the uh, tipping instability. Uh, it is very much like a toroidal ring um, behaving um, like a steel ring, um, and it tips about its mean position. And deformation, uh, when it's uh, even higher wave number, then uh, the tip, uh, the toroidal ring not only tips, it also deforms to create this kind of structure. The model is characterized by a parameter which is called the effective gravity parameter. This is basically the reduced gravity. It is defined um, um, by these parameters, the gravity at the, at the uh, tachoclean level, the um, fractional departure from adiabatic temperature gradient, <coughs> the tachoclean uh, thickness, the cell thickness, pressure scale height, HP, and solar radius at the tachoclean depth, and the uh, interior rotation rate. Uh, this is a non-dimensional parameter, and it can be as low as 10 to the minus 1 to 1 in the overshoot part of the tachoclean, and 10 to 1,000 uh, in the radiative part of the tachoclean. If effective gravity is low, then you can have more deformation of the top surface. And if the effective gravity is very high, then uh, top surface do not deform that much. Um, in the overshoot tachoclean, it is expected that it will deform much more than the radiative part. So I am not going through the details of the shallow water equations, because hydrodynamic shallow water equations can be found in these books. Um, but the, uh, due to uh, MHD, the modified part is this magnetic terms. Here, u is the longitudinal velocity, v is the latitudinal velocity. Similarly, a and b are latitude, long, uh, longitudinal and latitudinal component of magnetic field. And h is the uh, top surface deformation, uh, which is um, above the uh, tachoclean thickness, I mean, on, on top of the capital H. And uh, due to MHD generali generalization, uh, two more equations come in. Those are in A and B. And these are induction equation. And this is the modified um, divergence. This comes from the modified divergence B equal to 0 condition. And modified divergence B equal to 0 is divergence of, um, mm, divergence of 1 plus H into B equal to 0. So um, I'm not going into the uh, linear um, modes. Uh, there could be uh, lots of linear uh, modes in this system. And I'm showing directly the nonlinear evolution of this instability uh, in the Moloide configuration. So um, uh, you can see the arrow vectors, those are flow vectors, and uh, color maps represent the uh, top surface deformation. And you can see that uh, there is a quasi-periodic oscillation among uh, in the thickness and velocities, and a slow retrograde motion. And uh, you can also see that the flow is nearly geostrophic, um, because um, you can see that um, flow is clockwise 
uh, in the height high, uh, red is uh, height is represented by the red contours uh, so flow is clockwise at the height in the northern hemisphere and uh, it is uh, anti clockwise in the depression so approximately it is in geostrophic balance often people like to see uh, these uh, these thing these um, you know solutions in the um, in the cut out latitude longitude um, plan form type uh, frame so here is this so this is latitude this is longitude and this is latitude middle is the equator so basically you are seeing the same picture in in a, a different perspective now um why this uh, oscillation occur between uh, among the, the among the velocity perturbations and uh, heights of the tachocline this is very much like nonlinear or mechanism and um, i'm describing it first hydrodynamically that if you have um, in the tachocline you can have rossby waves type pattern so these are these are those pattern uh, red uh, red ellipse those are the pattern this is solar differential rotation when uh, these patterns can can have any kind of tilt they can have this kind of tilt they can they can have this kind of tilt when they are tilted in this way um, more eastward then they are able to extract energy from the differential rotation you can see from their um, um structure that they transport angular momentum poleward that means they extract from equator and they diffuse out the solar differential rotation from this dash configuration on the right the dash configuration since i cannot make it work it's becoming very difficult to explain let's see does it work yes so um, Uh, this is initial configuration, and after the Rossby waves extract energy from uh, the differential rotation, the differential rotation uh, slowly diffuses out, and it becomes like this. And uh, at a point, the differential rotation is not able to give any more energy to the Rossby waves, and so they lose their tilt. So from eastward tilt, they slowly lose their tilt to be neutral, but they don't stop at neutral. They overshoot into the westward tilt, and now the Rossby waves have energy to give back to the differential rotation. See, they can transport angular momentum now towards the equator, so they rebuild the differential rotation. And so, differential rot when the differential rotation gets rebuilt, then this this process repeats. this is very much like nonlinear or mechanism and we find this in our solution also this is from our solution that um, arrow vectors represent the flow and uh, red represents the height swelling of the tachocline fluid and blue the depression of the tachocline fluid so in the um, height you can see this kind of structure that means they are extracting energy from the differential rotation at this time solid curve is the differential rotation energy and this dash one is um uh, perturbation kinetic energy which is the energy of the rossby waves present there so they are uh, uh, these these um, fluid patterns are now extracting energy from the differential rotation so the differential rotation energy is decreasing when you when it's when it is in its minimum then you can have neutral kind of pattern of the rossby waves and uh, they cannot extract any more energy from the differential rotation but since they tilt back in the other direction they are able to give back the energy to the differential rotation so differential rotation gets rebuilt and so you can see this this out of phase oscillation between k bar and k prime and that creates this um periodicity this periodicity is very much similar to this periodicity burst season occurs when the rossby waves energy in is in its maximum why because that is the time when the tachocline top surface is maximally deformed and that can give rise 
to the um, bulging of the tachoclein entered the convection zone uh, to help erupt the toroidal magnetic fields, the spot producing magnetic fields. Now here is the parameter space study as a function of um, differential rotation amplitude the periodicity is very insensitive. Um, they are insensitive function of differential rotation amplitude, but they are very sensitive as function of effective gravity. They are, um, uh, you can have much slower system if uh, it's, um, the effective gravity is low, but when effective gravity is very high, you can have very fast season, seasonal variation. And as function of toroidal field strength, um, the periodicity decreases. And as function of latitude location of toroidal field, um, as you place it lower and lower latitude, the periodicity increases. As a function of uh, as a function of the progress of solar cycle, you would rather expect that the toroidal field migrates from high latitude to low latitude, so the um, seasons will be um, much less frequent as it progresses. One of these two, um, I, f I forgot somebody from the audience could help. Um, one of these two do not, um, do n uh, is not, one of these two is not consistent with observation, is opposite to the observation. But in any case, um, th these are the parameter variation and um, <coughs> um, you can, from matching the seasons, you can tell the parameters um, in the tachoclane. And um, I was telling that um, when the Rossby wave's energy is in its maximum, you can expect the burst this season. And here I'm showing how it happens. The uh, white uh, ribbon is the toroidal ring, and uh, red is the soiling, and blue is the depression. So you can see the toroidal ring coinciding uh, with the soiling region of the tachoclin first make their um, uh, entrance through the uh, convection zone. And therefore, these are the locations they, which, are, which can make their buoyant eruption to the surface. And thanks. Um, this is the evolution of the toroidal uh, band um, due to this um, in instability. And the, you can see how the uh, how uh, the latitude longitude location of the um, toroidal field coinciding with the soiling region is evolving as function of time. You can see many features here. You can see um, m equal to sometimes m equal to one mode dominating. Sometimes you can see more retrograde motion. Sometimes you see. Um, higher longitudinal wave numbers appearing. And you can also see um, some mixture of prograde and retrograde motion. And um, you can see the movement in latitude. You can see some gravity waves um, in the latitudinal direction. So um, if we want to, um, if we want to Im uh, get the imprint, of uh, flux emergence locations from the from these these soiling regions, the toroidal band coinciding with the soiling region, and if we try to match with observation, here is an attempt. What we did here, we took a, a, a surface magnetogram active region map uh, of a certain Carrington rotation, 1923. And if we take a particular snapshot from our model that best match with the surface um, active regions, then we just uh, allow it to evolve according to the model evolution. And you can see that in the model output match with the uh, next magnetogram. Actually, if I, if I show, the, uh, show you the continuous evolution of the surface magnetogram and 
my model generated toroidal band along with the height um, the swelling of the tachoclin you can see very nice coincid um, uh, very nice um, comparison of the surface magnetogram and the um, imprint from the tachoclin region this is at, uh, after one carrington rotation you can see uh, it matches well in both hemisphere then you go to uh, carrington rotation 1925 another Carrington rotation and you can see that you are missing things. Uh, this red arrow is pointing to an active region erupted um, which is from the depression region. Definitely that did not happen. So while going from here to there something have changed the um, basically the um, initial condition at the bottom region have changed and you know that as function of time, toroidal band migrates towards the equator due to dynamo action. So that has changed. Maybe the band width has changed. Maybe um, the uh, location in, in depth, uh, whether it was in radiative tachoclin or in the overshoot tachoclin, they might have changed the depth slightly. And that means that G parameter has also changed. So um, in order to, um, match continuously with the surface magnetogram, um, the model output, we need to uh, update the initial condition in a finite interval. And that can be done through data simulation, which is um, under progress at this moment. <clears throat> so in summary, I would like to say that um, uh, we have demonstrated that tachoclin nonlinear oscillations occurring in the shallow water model can cause the seasonal variability in solar activity in a time scale of 6 to 18 months. They occur due to nonlinear exchange among the Rossby waves, uh, basically the magnetized Rossby waves uh, in the solar tachoclin and the tachoclin differential rotation. And uh, for a wide range of parameters, we obtain the periodicity between 2 to 20 months range, uh, which is uh, very similar to the observed periodicity. And, uh, and as I said, predicting solar cycle peak is important, but it is equally important to predict when the next varsity period uh, of flares and CMEs will occur and how intense the season will be. It is not possible to uh, yet to um, predict the individual CME or active region. It is, we get the warning only when an, uh, a CME or active region, uh, uh, CME or, or flare have occurred on the sun. But um, if we can predict that, that a burst season is coming, then we can do a um, lot of progress that um, uh, to give warning uh, to the, um, uh, to, uh, avoid hazards to the terrestrial system. Thank you. Any questions for our speaker? How much deformations are we talking about in the integral line, like in terms of is, how uh, much does it bump up? Um, let me tell you, in, uh, it depends on the G value. Um, if you take very <coughs> low G, the lowest possible G you can take um, is like G equal to 0.001. And for that, the deformation is so big that top surface can reach the bottom and then it can make the disconnected fluid. So that is the limit of G you can use. And then um, um, for higher G, uh, it is approximately um, uh, proportional uh, to, to the G value with okay. respect to that. Yeah. Uh, um, so tachoclin thickness is like 0.04 solar radius, 4% of the solar radius. And for G equal to 0 0.001, you can make a deformation of that amount. And what's the like the real uh, realistic expectation uh, for G value for that? Um, we don't know. Um, 
definitely we can not go beyond G equal to 0 0.001 then we make a disconnected fluid and then it will not be a global uh, instability anymore it, it will it will make two disconnected fluid regions. Um, what is the expectation only observation can someday if helioseismology can observe that deformation amount uh, they can tell us or um, if they can <coughs> observe the kinetic helicity pattern there um, or the flow pattern actually um, uh, Lauren Gison is not here. Uh, he, he wanted the simulation data to invert and so he can, he, um, they can, their group can tell us whether it can be observed by helioseismology and then we can get an idea how much uh, to expect about the deformation or, or flow structure. <coughs> so, so Malsumi, you talked about matching the, the period of the magneto Rossby waves. Yeah. Can you say anything about the amplitude and how that works with the whether the, the amplitude of this uh, seasonal oscillation with with the solar cycle? Um, um, amplitude with respect to the reference, right? So um, <laughs> with respect to the observations, yeah. So the the observa the amplitude of this seasonal uh, variability changes as the solar cycle. Oh, changes, change. Uh, so. Yeah. Um, let me see. I did not try to um, estimate that yet. Well, uh, so I just go there in the plot and try to give the answer to you. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So uh, it is point. Uh, somewhere close to point zero 0.01 and this is like uh, approximately point zero zero 0.08, zero zero 0.07. So it's at this moment it's 20 to 30 percent. This is for a particular parameter. Uh, and it is, it can, um, uh, in the observation that variation is much more uh, during maximum and much less during minimum. So um, I think if I do data simulation, then I will be able to know uh, the parameter values for which I can exactly match the observation. Have you looked into the uh, helicity evolution during the TNO? Did you look into this? Uh, no, I haven't, but yeah. it's possible to look at. Okay. Thank you very much for that. I, um, in the next um, calculation, I, I will do that. Actually, uh, a postdoc was working, uh, and uh, she was very interested in estimating the kinetic helicity evolution, particularly for her dynamo work, and um, so we will do very soon. And and. I hope somebody will correct, uh, somebody will tell me which one is not consistent with the observation. Maybe Temuri can tell uh, one of them is consistent with observation and other is not. Um, as a function of field strength, uh, it is consistent, right? In, in, you have the observational, I, I don't remember yet, the observational um, estimate of uh, yeah, field strength. So if field strength increases, then um, uh, decreases. decreases. So this is, this is the consistent one. And as function of latitude migration, this is the inconsistent one with the observation. Any other questions? Okay, let's thank our speaker one more time, our final speaker. And uh, we will adjourn for today. Uh, the shuttle should be here in about...